Okay. I'm going to feel like, uh, you know the, the, the one-man band? He's got this banjo and the harmonica, the drums and the cymbals. Because I got the clicker, got to have my clicker. I got the microphone and I got my notes. You see, this is a new teaching for you guys. So it's new and there's a lot of things I wanted to make sure I cover. So I got to bring my notes today. So let's go ahead and jump right on into it. The three keys to proper biblical interpretation. In my years of uh, studying the Hebrew language, I found three keys that are helpful to keep in mind whenever you're reading the biblical text. And that's what I want to share with you here. I'm going to take you all out to dinner. You have your choice. You can have this, okay, or you can have this. Which would you prefer, the one on the left or the one on the right? On the right. McDonald's on the left or a nice classy meal on the right. Why? Why would you rather have the one on the right? They both give you food. They fill your belly. What's the difference? The wine. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not lobster. <laughs> I checked the picture. I, I looked at it. And I said, yeah, this looks kosher. <laughs> the difference is quality of the food, quality of the atmosphere. Any, all of us would much rather have a nice, classy meal at a nice restaurant than rather go to McDonald's. How many of you ever heard it said, you don't really need to get into the original languages. You can just read the Bible for what it says. It'll tell you everything you need to know. You can forget about all that other stuff. How many of you heard that? Been told that? Okay. Well, that's, that's the difference between these two restaurants. The English translations, when you open up a Bible and read the English translation like it was a novel, you're going to get some sustenance. You're going to be fed. It may not be that nutritious, may not even be that tasty, but you will get fed. However, if you dig into the languages, use the resources that are available to you, you're going to get a lot more quality in your studies. Agreed? And I've seen a lot of that here since I've been here. You guys are doing great. The, the first key, the first key is culture. And you, it's been drilled into you already, time and time again. We come from a Greco-Roman culture. The Hebrews came from an Eastern Hebraic culture. Very different. I shared some examples yesterday of how different these two cultures can be. So you have to keep in mind that when you're reading the text, you're not reading a novel written by the guy down the street. You're reading an events, you're reading of events and things that had occurred thousands of years ago in a different culture who think differently and act differently than we do. You have to take your mind, basically dump everything you've ever learned and replace it with Hebraic thought. It's not easy. It is hard. I shared some examples of myself where I'm still thinking in Greek. I'm reading the scriptures wrong because I'm reading them from a Greek perspective. It's not an easy thing to do. When we how do we study culture? Well, one way is through archaeology. Archaeologists go out and they dig down into the ground. They find uh, uh, artifacts, ancient writings, ancient documents that tell us about their culture. Another method is through anthropology. Anthropology studies people's behaviors around the world. One example are, is a book I read a, a, quite a few years ago, an excellent book. It's not one you would normally think of in biblical studies, and it's actually about Muslims, but it's called The Nomads of the Nomads by, can't remember his name, sorry. Uh, it's out of print. If you can find a copy of it, it's fascinating reading because what he does is he lives with these Bedouins, the Bedouin tribes, who live the same way Abraham did 3,000 years ago. If we want to know how Abraham lived, we study the Bedouin culture because they do many of the same thing. They have many of the same customs as Abraham did. 
uh, up at the top, archaeology is the study of historic peoples and their cultures by analysis of their artifacts, inscriptions, monuments, and other such remains. Anthropology is the study of origins, physical and cultural development, <clears throat> excuse me, and social customs and beliefs of humankind. These things are very important to us because we have to understand the author's mindset. How did he perceive certain things? We must think the same way. Here's a picture of some of these nomads. The camel, the tent, the clothing that they wear, the tent. You know what one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is? Genesis chapter 18. You're like, what? What happened there? That's where no or Abraham is sitting at the door of his tent. That's my favorite verse, 18 verse 1. Because there is so much in that one verse about the Hebraic culture that we just don't understand. And when you start to understand their culture and why he was sitting at the tent, what was he doing? Uh, it, it just comes, the text comes alive to you. Here's an example. And I mentioned yesterday about the stars. Okay? And I kind of left it at that. That's because I'm going to talk about it now. Here's Isaiah 40, verse 22. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Does that make sense to us? Do we understand what he's talking about? It sounds nice. It's a beautiful piece of scripture, but what is he talking about? We have to understand the nomadic tent in order to understand this passage. The nomadic, nomads' tents in uh, the Near East, the Bedouins, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they lived in goat hair tents. They would take the hair from the goat, spin it into uh, threads, and then they would weave these threads together to make panels about two to three feet wide, and then the length of the tent, 20 feet or so. Okay. Then they would take this panel and place it in the tent. Every year they would re replace a panel uh, because they get <clears throat> bleached out and old, so they have to replace the panels. If you go inside of the tent and look up, what color is the goat hair? Black, black. And these fibers, these fibers would mesh together like this, but there would be holes in between them because there's space in between the fibers. So what do you see when you look up? You see a black blanket with pinholes of light. What does it look like? Stars. It looks like stars. Walk outside of the tent at night, look up at the heavens, what do you see? A black curtain with pinholes of light. The way they understood this or the way they saw this is when the child is inside the tent of the father, actually the tent of the mother because the mothers owned the tent, not the fathers. When they went into the tent and they looked up and they saw their father's protection over them, that tent was their protection from the environment and from the elements. And when they walked outside, they could see God's tent over them protecting them. Does that, does that explain the scripture a little better so you understand this from Isaiah's perspective? I hope so. Another example. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Have you ever seen a gate with a head? I haven't. What is he talking about gates? Is a gate, is he talking about a literal gate that you open up? This is what's called a euphemism. Taking one word and replacing it with another word that doesn't, they have no connection and meaning. Where did the judges sit when they judged people? At the gates, at the city gates. The gates is a euphemism for the judges. So the psalm is talking about the judges. Lift up your heads, O judges. In other words, don't, don't put your nose down to people. Okay? Keep your head up. Look at them. Where did Lot stay when the uh, messengers came? The gates. What was he doing there? Being a judge. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. The Eastern culture of the Hebrews is very different from our own Western culture. We must read the Bible from the perspective of the culture of the authors and their contemporaries. Key number two is the language. I'll say this now and I'll probably say it again. Hebrew is not Greek. Kind of sounds stupid, but we forget that. We can't think in Greek when we're reading the Hebrew language. Some of the studies 
that are uh, in languages are called philology. This is the study of written records, kind of like our Bible. It's a written record. I, I find it interesting, and I do the same thing myself. When we open up the Bible, we just kind of look at it like any old book. We put it up on the bookshelf next to uh, Mark Twain and Oliver Twist, okay? But it's not just a book. This, these were originally scrolls, ancient documents. You have in your hands ancient, or on your computer, <laughs> uh, like I do, uh, ancient, ancient documents, historical records. The study of written records, their authenticity and original form and the determination of their meaning. Etymology. Etymology is the study of historical linguistic change as manifested in individual words. We looked a lot of that last night, didn't we? Uh, Rob Miller shared some examples of etymology, of how one word is related to another, we get its definitions from its related, related words and cognates. This is uh, just a, an example of the Dead Sea Scrolls, just some writing from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And as I said, this is the Hebrew language, it's not Greek. We have to remember that when we're reading the Bible, we are reading a translation of the Hebrew language. And always keep that in mind as you're studying. What was the Hebrew word that is used there and what does it mean? I'll go off on a, on a rabbit trail here. When I first started really seriously studying the Bible, I got myself a concordance and uh, Strong's Dictionary. Now these are great tools, uh, but the first thing I recognized or the first problem is how the translators were not consistent in how they translated words. I'll give you an example, and this is the word that broke the, uh, the camel's back for me. <clears throat> the word nefesh, what does nefesh mean? Okay, I hear breath, being, spirit. Uh, you know that that word in all translations, is, uh, like for example, the King James, the word nefesh is translated 75 different ways. 75 different ways. It's translated as soul, being, person, life, breath, dead body. Okay? I, I didn't understand why this, why so inconsistent with the translations. That's when I finally said, I, I give up. I don't trust them anymore. I've got to learn it for myself. What does it mean? Uh, uh, very simply, the nefesh is, uh, the best translation is really being. I like being because it's literally the whole of the person. It's not an entity within you. It is you. It's all of you. Your character, your personality, your organs, your skin, your hair, uh, your uh, everything. It's, it's the whole person. Your essence. Yeah, your person. Uh, here's an example of how it's important to understand language and how it relates to our Bible. And Aharon and Hur held up his hands. Uh, Monte was just quoting this verse. His hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now, if you open your Bible and started reading that, you go, yeah, that's great. That's really great. But you know what? There's a, there's, there's a, there's a word in there that would blow your mind when you find out what it is. Well, maybe not blow your mind. It's the word steady. Anybody know what the Hebrew is behind that? Who said that? Ah! <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> Figures. <laughs> emunah. What does emunah mean? No. Oh, come on, Eddie. It means steady. Yes, it's translated as faith. We're used to the word faith. This is what I call a religious word. Okay? Faith has a certain connotation, a certain meaning that isn't in the Hebrew. Emunah means to be steadfast, to be remain steady, firm. Okay? And when we read faith in, in these passages, what we should be doing is getting rid of that, that abstract thought of faith and replace it with the concrete being of steadiness and firm. And then you'll be able to start, that, that gets you to start reading the text from a Hebraic perspective. It's really not that difficult. Now Moshe was keeping the flocks of his father-in-law, Yitro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And I don't remember why I put this verse in here. That's what the notes are for. Oh, oh, of course. <laughs> the word there, wilderness. What is a wilderness? Wasteland, 
What? Open pasture? Desert? What? Unpopulated? Okay, those are all really good definitions of a wilderness. Are those Hebraic definitions of a wilderness? <laughs> Anybody know what the Hebrew word is for, for wilderness? But Midbar. Midbar. Okay. What's its root? What's its root? Devar. Very good. What does Devar mean? Word. What does word have to do with wilderness? Do we know? We need to, that's what we need to learn. Because when you understand the connections between these words, the Bible jumps off the page and comes alive to you. The word devar does not really mean word. It literally means order. Order. Not like a, an order from a general to his men. An arrangement. An arrangement. An ordered arrangement. What are words? They're ordered arrangements that are put together to form sentences. Make sense? A wilderness is a place of order. Where do most Americans go? I shouldn't say most, but a lot of Americans go for vacation. Camping. How many of us have gone camping? Put them up. I want to see. I want to see. Put them up. Okay, everybody. <laughs> Pretty much everybody. Why? Why do we like to camp? Quiet. Peaceful. Bugs. We get away from the, quote, rat race, and we go to a place of peace. It's a place of order. Have you ever noticed that in the wilderness, everything is in order? There's an ecosystem there that survives together in peace and harmony. There's a balance. Balance was a big issue to the ancient Hebrews because that's what they were looking for in their lives. In the wilderness is a place where you can find perfect harmony, perfect balance. God can teach us. I mean, I've heard it before. My church is the mountains. You know what? That's kind of true. Because there God can teach us about himself through the order there. Let's contrast the word midvar with the word ir. What's the word ir mean? City. What words come from ir in that root? Darkness. Evil. Wicked. Those are the words that come from that root. Okay? Why does God want us to do Sukkot at least one week out of every year? Because he wants us back into the wilderness. See, I don't personally believe that a Sukkot can be put in the driveway. Okay? Personally, I think we should be taking it back. He said, do it like your forefathers did. Go out into the wilderness, put your tent up, live like uh, um, the rabbi or the, uh, what's his name? Yeah. Uh, no, not Rob. Um, is he here? The guy that spoke this morning. No. The baguette ivory. Reuven. Thank you. Thank you. What Reuven was saying, you know, he had a little problem with the way they're doing Sukkot. Oh, I do too. We should be going out into the wilderness because that's where the forefathers were. That's where we learn about God. We go out into the place of order one week out of every year to learn that. Most messianics, when they do Sukkot, where do they go? Well... Okay, but most Messianic groups at least have available a place out in the wilderness or in a, in a place outside away from the cities, okay? Uh, anybody here named Deborah? One? Anybody else? Deborah? Only one? What does Deborah mean? B. Does that sound strange? Is Deborah re re related to Devar? Yes, it's the feminine form of Devar. Devar is masculine. Devara is the feminine form. What does the B have to do with all this? Order. They're an ordered colony of insects. Perfect, perfect harmony within a beehive. There's a lot of lessons in bees. We're going to talk about honey, too, here in a little bit. Hebrew is not Greek. There it is. I'm saying it again. Don't forget that. Every language is closely related to the culture of its people. Uh, somebody else was talking this morning. I don't remember who it was. Uh, you remove the, the, the culture or the language of a person, you remove their culture. If you remove them from their culture, they lose their language. They're so tied together that you cannot have one without the other. Okay? The Hebrew language is closely tied to their culture. Not our culture. 
We cannot read the Bible from our cultural perspective, but only through theirs. What do the words of the Bible mean from a Hebraic perspective? This is what you have to ask yourself when you're studying. When you come across any word, it could be the word and. And in some places, that's a powerful word, depending on how it's used. We look to the word devar. That Hebrew word has a certain meaning that's lost in the translation. Have you ever heard that expression, lost in the translation? It's true. What are the roots and cognates of a Hebrew word? Cognate is just simply another word that's related to another word. Okay? These are the things that we need to be asking ourselves when we're, when we're studying the biblical text. The third key is thought. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday. How did the Hebrews think? Philosophy. The study of the basic principles and concepts of a particular branch of knowledge. There are two major branches of thought. What are they? Western and Eastern. There's many sub-branches, but those are the two major branches across the world. In the ancient world, we're talking five, about 6,000 years ago, there was only one form of thinking, one major form of thinking, and that was Eastern thought. It wasn't until the Greeks came along and they started developing a new philosophy of life, and that's when the Western philosophy was born. They were the minority for a little while. Then there was a major war that occurred about 4,000 to 3, or 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. Oh, excuse me, 3,000 to 2,000 years ago. And this war was a war between Eastern thought and Western thought. Guess who won? Western thought won. Today, only a very small minority of the population thinks in Eastern thought because the Western thought is invading constantly. When we conk or go go out in the 1800s, 1700s to the uh, Indian the Indian nations, the islands, what it was the first thing we did? We made them conform to our way of thinking. That's what Western thought does. It invades. Psychology is the study of the mental processes and behavior. Here's an example. I have two pictures here. I have an oak tree and a buck, a goat buck. Would you consider those one and the same thing? No? Why? He says, yeah, he knows the trick questions. Why would we not consider the same? Because they don't look anything alike, do they? But what's the mistake I just made? What they look like. That's Greek thinking. Hebraic thought is concerned with what? Function. Excellent. Very good. Function. What is the function of these two things? Exactly. The oak is the strongest of the woods in the forest. The strongest. Anybody do wood cutting? Uh, which would you rather cut if you had your choice, pine or oak? <laughs> you can go through pine like butter. Oak will take you all day long. What is a buck? Anybody here owned a buck? A deer or a goat buck? One? One? Wow, two? Okay. You're familiar with bucks then? Boy, they smell nice, don't they? <laughs> my wife knows too. She's listening. Uh, we had a buck. And when you first get them, you're like, oh my gosh, what does that smell? Uh, after a while, though, you get used to it, and you actually begin to uh, uh, appreciate it. <laughs> a buck can get very, very big. Our does that we had, you know, they might have been about this high. The buck at his back was about here, okay? And if he wanted to move you, he was going to move you, okay? If it wasn't by his smell, it was going to be by his muscles. Strength. These both are, are very, very similar in Hebraic thought because of their strength, the strength of the flock, the strength of the forest. They both are the Hebrew word ayil. When you look in the Bible and you see it say uh, 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 a stag, okay, which is really a buck, a stag, or a buck. That can also be translated as an oak tree. In fact, there are places where the King James will translate it as an oak tree, but the NIV will translate it as a, as a buck or a stag. Okay? So your translations sometimes, they're not really sure how to translate it. That's because they're still thinking in Greek. They're trying to tell you what it looks like. The Hebrew author is trying to tell you what its function is. <clears throat> Psalms 22, 22, 23 in the Christian Bibles. 
I will tell of thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. Two words in there I want to look at. First one's the word name. There's a lot of discussion in the Messianic movement about the name. Let's, I'm not going to talk about the name. I'm just going to talk about the word Shem. Shem is usually translated as a name. However, in our way of thinking, a name is nothing but an identifier. No different than if you were a number. Hi, one, two, three, how are you? Okay, it's just an identifier. Bill, George, they don't mean it. Those, those words don't mean anything to us in our culture. Yeah, we know George means earth, but that's not really part of our makeup, the way we think. Agreed? Okay, names are just identifiers. In the Hebrew culture, every name is a word with meaning. Devorah means be. Okay, Ruvain. See the sun. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's a verb and a noun put together. See the sun. Ra'u, ra'u, vain. See the sun. So every word describes action. Every name describes action. That name then is their character. Anybody hear the word, uh, Hebrew word neshema? What is neshema? What? No? Neshema. Uh, Genesis 2 7. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath, the neshema of life. Neshema is breath. What is breath? Well, to us, breath is simply the exchange of air in the lungs. Okay? Well, that's kind of, that's very Greek thinking. Okay, in the Hebraic mind, your breath is your character. It's what makes you, you. That's your breath. So when you see in the Bible when it says the breath of God... It's not talking, <sighs> that's not the breath of God. The breath of God is what's inside of him that makes him him. What's his character? Okay. Your name is your character in Hebraic thought. So when the Bible says, I will tell of, the, uh, tell of your name to the brethren, it's not talking about its pronunciation. This is how you're supposed to pronounce the name. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about, I will tell of your character to my brethren. That is what's important in the text, is what's God's character, not how you pronounce the name. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. What does praise mean? Is, what? Hallelujah is the Hebrew word. Uh, praise. Let me ask you this. Is that an abstract word or a concrete word? Very good. It's an abstract word. Is abstract Hebrew or Greek? Greek. Okay, we got a problem with that word right now. We've got to ask ourselves, okay, what is this word from a Hebraic perspective? It is the word, what was it again? Ha hallelujah. Okay, actually, hallelujah is the plural form. Uh, all of you praise. Hallel is the noun, hallel. It comes from the root hall. Hall is an ancient word that's not used in the biblical text, but it means the. The. Okay? What, what do we use the word the for? If I said to, you, uh, to my son, uh, Josiah, you're listening, aren't you? <laughs> uh, go to the bookshelf and get me a book. What am I asking for? Any book. I don't care. I'm just looking for a book. But however, if I said go to the, the shelf and, buy, and get me the book, what am I asking for? Maybe the Bible, but maybe in the context we're doing school and he knows what book I'm talking about. Okay? All right, specific, it's a specific book. So Hall is say, look at that. That's special. Okay, so whenever you see the word the in the Bible, it's saying, look at that, that's special. But be aware that the is added into the text a lot by the translators. It kind of has to be because of English grammar. So uh, that's one of the advantages of being able to see the Hebrew text is you know when the the is there and when it's not because the, the English is not very consistent. There should be, you know how they say in the King James they have italicized words? Those are the words that were added in. Okay, sometimes... Uh, however, I've seen italicized words that, that are there in the Hebrew, and I've seen words in there that are not italicized that are not in the Hebrew, so I haven't figured that one out yet. Anyway, hal means the, but more literally, the, the hay is a picture. If you remember, it's, it's a man with his two arms raised up. Okay, that's the pictographic script for that letter, and it means, wow, look at that. The lamed is the shepherd's staff. talked about that yesterday. That means to guide towards uh, uh, something. Uh, the shepherd would take his staff and he would guide his sheep. So it means look towards, look towards. 
Uh, it's also Hallel. This word Hallel is related to a word that is translated as Lucifer. Lucifer. Lucifer actually only comes from the Latin Vulgate. That, that is not there in the Hebrew. It's literally the star, the, the bright shining star, or the, the star that you look at. It's it means a star. It's one of the words for a star. And I believe uh, that this star is the North Star, that Hallel is literally the North Star. Uh, how many of you here could go out of the night sky and find the North Star? Raise your hand. About maybe 15% of you. The North Star is not easy to find. It's not very bright, but it's always constant. It's right there in the sky, right there in the north, and it never moves. You know how the, the stars revolve around that one point in the sky. You ever seen a picture of the stars as they revolved around? Okay. That center point is the star Polaris. That's the, what we call the North Star. Although 3,000 years ago it was a different star because of the changing, but there was still a North Star there. I believe Hallel is specifically the North Star, and when it says praise Yah, it's not necessarily saying just, you know, throw up your hands and go, wow, I like you. It's saying look to Yah as your light because the North Star is the one that guides you on your journey. You always know north because of where the North Star is. You always know your directions. So that's your direction finder, just like Yah is our direction finder. Okay? And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. It was very good. Cool. What does very good mean? You know, what? Wonderful. Wonderful. That's abstract. <laughs> what? I heard it back there. Functional. That's right. Functional. The Hebrew word tov doesn't just mean good because good's kind of like, that's nice. But it means functional. If I have a bicycle and I've got all the parts laying out here on the floor, is that a good bicycle? No, it's not functional. It is dysfunctional, therefore it is raw. That's the opposite. Tov vara, good and bad, or translates good and evil, oftentimes. So good is literally something that's functional. Is, uh, I mentioned earlier that, that the Hebraic mind tries to bring balance to everything. How many of you here, raise your hand, is God good? Okay, so uh, Elohim Tov. Elohim is Tov. Elohim is functional, correct? All right, let me change that. Elohim is Ra. How many of you, raise your hand if you think Elohim is Ra. Well, I got one. <laughs> Elohim is Ra. Do I have that verse here? I think so. No, I don't. Uh, Hosea. Uh, I form the light and I create the earth. I, I, I do something and I create evil. Or Ra. God is both, God, the Hebrew mind needs to find everything in balance. If I put you in a room of pure light, what happens to you? You're blind. If I put you in a room of pure darkness, what happens to you? You're blind. You have to be in a balance of light and dark. Is, how many, what's your favorite, just think, what's your favorite food? Ice cream, spaghetti, okay? Why is it your favorite food? Because you're comparing it to something you don't like, right? If you ate nothing but ice cream your entire life, would that taste good to you? No, because you have nothing to compare it to. God is tov. We see that in Genesis chapter 1 where God takes all these elements, brings them together, and forms the world. Six, verses, six chapters later, what do we see? We see God tearing it apart. We see him working in Ra. We see him in Tov. We see him in Ra. He is a perfect balance of both. It's, this is contrary to our way of thinking. Uh, I have another presentation that if I have time after this one that goes into another verse, I'll go ahead and bring it up now. Uh, Lot uh, has these, uh, uh, the men of Sodom coming to him saying, give us those men that came to your house. What does he do? He throws his daughters to him, saying, take them. We're like, what is this guy nuts? Because he is in a culture different from our own. So we look at him as nuts because he's not doing what we would do. Why is he doing that? There are guests. And even today in Bedouin cultures and in those nomadic tribes, the number one priority is hospitality. 
What was Sodom and Gomorrah's sin that they were destroyed for? What was it? Inhospitality. Ezekiel tells us that. Because they were inhospitable. But you see, we don't like that. That goes contrary. It goes against our grain. So we have to just dump what we think when we're reading the text. We have to remember their world, their perspective, not our own. Dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. Uh, the question was, what does Ra really mean? Dysfunctional. Okay, key number three, thought, concrete versus abstract. We talked about that. Function versus appearance. Active versus passive. A noun in the English language is passive. It's an inanimate object. In Hebrew, nouns are active. It's not just a mountain top. It is the head of the landscape rising up out of the ground. Everything is in motion in Hebrew thought. If it stands still, it don't, it's nothing. Everything is in motion in the Hebrew mind. In English, what do you have to have in every sentence to make it a complete sentence? A verb. If you don't have a verb, it's wrong. You'll get an F on your paper. Okay? In Hebrew, sentences do not need verbs. The king is good. In Hebrew, melech tov, king good, no verb. It's very common. You don't have to have verbs. Why? Because nouns act as verbs. A verb describes the action of something. A noun describes someone of the action. They're both related. Melech is the one who reign, or is the reigning of the one who sits on the throne. The Melech, the king, is the one who sits on the throne and reigns over the people. See? So you don't have to have verbs. Everything's in motion. Everything's active in Hebrew. Applying the various ologies, archaeology, anthropology, philology, etymology, applying all of these ologies to the biblical text, we can more accurately define our theology. Or maybe theology. Theology. There, the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to spend a little bit of time about the Ark of the Covenant. Let me preface this with that, that <clears throat> these are interpretations of the Hebrew text. You may agree with me or disagree with me, but it's an exercise to show that if you get into the original language, how the words jump off the page and come to life and might affect how you read that text. There I will meet with you and from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim that are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you of all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Let's take a look at some several components of that verse. Testimony. What is a testimony? A will. It is a it com it comes it is the Hebrew word edut. It comes from the word edut, which that word comes from ed, someone or something that provides or serves as evidence, a witness. A testimony is a witness. A witness is one who provides evidence. What is a perfect witness? Eyewitness? Uh, I used to be a firefighter. I'd arrive on scene and one person tells me, yeah, that black car came around the corner and hit that yellow one. This guy says, yeah, that yellow car was sitting still and a green one hit it. Is eyewitness? We never, never trusted eyewitnesses. Okay? They're always wrong. My wife would come to me and say, we're going out, okay, going out to dinner. How do I look? What do I say? <laughs> Lovely, dear. <laughs> Yeah, I know she's listening. <laughs> Lovely, dear. She, well, does she trust me? Where does she go? To the mirror. Does the mirror lie? We got mirrors right here. I can stand in front of this mirror, and it don't lie. It tells me exactly what I look like. Here's a picture of a mirror. Okay? It don't lie. It is a perfect, perfect witness. It's an exact reflection of what is in front of it. Take this book of the law, the Torah, 
and put it by the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against you. Anybody have a problem with that? You know what? I sure, I, I read that and I'm like, against me? That's not the way I understood Torah. See that word right there? Translators added that word. It's not there in the text. Do I think I have the, the literal? No, I don't even have the literal. The literal just simply says uh, at the end there that it may be there a witness with you, in you. It's the prefix ba, which means in, but can also mean with. It is a witness there with you. The Torah is a mirror. It's supposed to be the mirror. We're supposed to be able to stand in front of that Torah and look at it, and we're supposed to see our reflection in it. If we don't, it ain't going to lie, we see our faults in it, don't we? The Torah is the mirror, the witness. Now, why was it placed beside the ark? Do we care? Do you think that's significant? Everything's significant. We'll come back to that. Covenant. What is the word for covenant? Barit. What does barit mean? <laughs> no. I mean, yes, it does. What's the literal? Okay, covenant. Is that an abstract or a concrete? No, it's an abstract. It's an abstract word. Okay? What is the concrete meaning of barit? Meat. Meat. That's weird. Have you ever heard that before? The root is bara, which means to, to have meat. It's related to another word meaning fat. Okay? You've heard of the term, there's the word barit. Okay, to, the verb bara means to choose, select meat, choice meat. Prime rib? Hmm. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? How many of you ever heard the term or making a covenant? I will make a covenant with you. It's right. It's not make. The Hebrew is karat barit. Karat means to cut the meat. To cut the meat. Whenever they did a covenant, what would they do? Got to remember, we're thinking in their culture. What would they do? They would cut it in half. They would shed the blood. The blood could be collected for part of the ceremony. But they would take an animal and cut it in half. Remember that story with Abraham? I think I have that here. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. He took the pieces and split them into two. What then happened? What did those things do? Actually, that thing. Smoking fire pot and flaming torch is one entity. Okay, I've heard a lot of teachings that these are two different things. And if I'm stepping on somebody's toes or killing a sacred cow, I apologize. But a smoking pot and a flaming torch is Hebrew poetry. It's a parallelism saying one thing two different ways. How do we know that? How do we know I'm just not blowing smoke myself? Because the verb there, uh, pass between, it's the Hebrew verb avar, which is the root of Hebrew, avar, and it's written in the singular, he passed through. So because the verb is singular, that means the nouns have to be one, singular, so we know that it's a Hebrew parallelism, saying one thing two different ways. Anyway, the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch then pass through the pieces. They would do a figure eight. <clears throat> Whenever in that ancient culture they would do it, they would cut the animal in two. One piece went there, one piece went there. The two people doing the covenant would pass through the pieces. Why? If you broke the covenant, if I break the covenant, you can do to me what we just did to that animal. Yeesh. Which is why Abraham could not take part of that covenant. Monty was talking about earlier that God made the covenant and established it forever. Okay? He didn't make it, he didn't make Abraham pass through the pieces. He himself alone passed through the pieces. In Jeremiah we read, And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant which they made before me, I will make them like the calf which they cut in two and passed between its parts. If Israel does not follow the covenant that God made with them at Horeb, he has the right to cut them in two and pass through the pieces. What happened to Israel? 
They were cut into two, Israel and Judah. Does that mean the covenant's over? No. No. But he did cut them in two, just like we see here in Jeremiah. The ark. Here we have a picture of uh, an artist's or, or sculptor's rendition of what the ark looks like. We're going to spend a little time here looking at this ark and the way that it might have looked. And I say might because we will never know until it's actually found. How late do I go to until? Okay. Thank you. The Ark of the Covenant. Oops. Here we go. I always pointed at the screen. Isn't that stupid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, television. Shows you how much I watch TV. The Hebrew word for ark is aron. How many arks are in the Bible? Three. Ooh, that's good. What are they? Ark of the bulrushes. That's Moshe when he was an infant. Ark of the covenant. The ark of Noah. No. No. There are three arcs, but the Ark of Noah is not one of them. So Joseph died being 110. Oh, excuse me. You were wrong. I'm sorry. The, bull, the Ark of the Bulrushes is not in our own. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin. That's the Hebrew word, our own. That's one. The coffin of Yosef. We didn't, we didn't know that, did we? That's a surprise to me when I found that. And that's significant because I always assumed that that was just a coffin, but it's the same word used for the Ark of the Covenant. They shall make an ark of acacia wood, Exodus 25. There's the second one. The third one is in 2 Kings. Then uh, Yehoiada, the priest, took a chest and bored holes in the lid. A chest. That's the third ark, Aron. The Hebrew word for the Ark of Noah is Teva, and it's a, a vessel. A floating vessel. And that's the word that is used for the Ark of, of Moshe or the, uh, the, uh, the basket that Moshe was put in. It was a teva. It's a floating vessel. So aron literally just means, as we see from these scriptures, it means a box. It really doesn't sound that special, does it? Okay. The Hebrew or, or root of that is the word or. What's or mean? Light. Light is another word for order. Hebrews liked order. Okay, I think most of us do. Hebrew uh, understood light as order. If it was in darkness, there's disorder. Light brings about order. Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be light. He was shipped. What do you do when you walk into a dark room? What's the first thing you do? Turn on the light so you can see what's going on. God turned on the lights. A box is used uh, to... Make order. to play, You place things in it so that you don't have a bunch of toys scattered all over the floor. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Is it important that it was made out of acacia wood? Is there any significance to that? Yes, there is. Thank you for noticing. This is uh, uh, the thorns of an acacia tree. The acacia tree, there are several, many different species. One of those in uh, the land of Israel is, grows these huge thorns on it. Okay. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and lo, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. That word there for bush, where is it? Bush, is sine. It's a thorn. It's a thorn bush. The bush, the burning bush, it wasn't just any old bush. It was a bush that had thorns, or a, a plant that had thorns, could it have been the acacia tree? Maybe. We don't know for sure. We just know that it had thorns. These are the uh, blossoms of the acacia tree. We talked about blossoms and tzitzit yesterday. Uh, where does honey come from? Bees. Devorah. Bees. They go to flowering plants of many different varieties, bring it back, and they make honey. What happens to honey when it sits on the shelf for a long period of time? Doesn't that, doesn't that bug you? Okay, Kind of ruins it. Okay, When bees make honey from these flowers, from the acacia, it is the only honey 
that will never crystallize. Never. Whoop. My son, eat honey, for it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul. Wisdom is like honey. Where, is it, where do we find our wisdom? The Torah. The Torah is honey. The rabbis would, uh, when they're teaching children, they would take and they'd open up their, their, their Bible, and everywhere the name of God was, the Yahweh, they would place a piece of candy over that. And the child would be reading the text. When he comes to that piece of candy, he says the name, and he gets to eat the piece of candy. So he's, he's equating the name of Yahweh with sweetness. The Torah is the sweetness of Yahweh. So the honey is being equated with Torah. Now, you know, I'm not even using my notes. I hope I'm not missing anything. <laughs> when uh, we talked yesterday about keeping the Torah, I didn't really go into much detail because I wanted to cover it here. The Hebrew word keeping is shamar, and I said it meant to guard. More literally, shamar, uh, let me give you a picture, because remember, Hebrew words are action-oriented pictures, is if the shepherd was out with his flock, they're nomadic people, they raise sheep. The shepherd could be out for days at a time away from home, out in the wilderness, the place of order. And if he was going to be out at night, there's predators out there. He had to protect his sheep, his flock. So he would create a corral of thorns. That is the word shamar, creating a corral of thorns. In fact, the word shamir is another word that means thorns. So when the Bible talks about keeping the Torah, it means put around it a, a hedge of protection like thorns, which will keep the predators out. So when we say Shomer Torah, keep the Torah, what it's equating to is that honey, they would take the honey hives of the bees and they would place it in the acacia tree. I did a lot of research on this to find out how they did this, but they would take the hives and they would place it in the acacia tree. Why? What? Because of the thorns. It would protect it from the bears and the other animals that can now is, is being protected from them because of the thorns. The Torah is a picture, or the honey is a picture of the Torah, which is supposed to be protected by the thorns. In this, and this is a physical picture that we see in the scriptures of how the Hebrews understood these concepts. Is the text starting to come alive for you? Okay, in ways that you didn't know that it could, did you? The acacia wood, uh, one of the species, is a dark acacia. It's called a black acacia. And it's a dark wood. Thick grained, tightly grained, and it's very dark. And thou shalt all overlay it with pure gold. Not just gold, not just gold, but pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it. The imagery that I've had of this verse is that you have this, the ark was made of the acacia wood, a chest, a box, and then they would take gold and overlay the whole thing, and you would now have what looked like a gold box, right? Kind of like a facade. While looking at this, I found that that may not be what's going on here, and what always troubled me is the word pure gold, okay? Gold in its natural state is pure, okay, and, and it's very malleable. You can take one ounce of gold and hammer it down and cover 300 square feet. You can take one ounce of gold and string it into a wire that's a mile long. It's very malleable. Remember that God gave wisdom to the crafters and taught them how to work with gold. If you take gold and you pound it that thin, anybody know what happens to it? No? What? You can see through it. It's translucent. Not trans, not like a pane of glass, but light can pass through it. What happens if you take a dark surface and put a, refl a uh, clear surface over it? What do you have? A mirror? What did I say earlier that the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant was? A testimony? And a testimony is a what? A mirror. This is a helmet from the Apollo program. It is a gold translucent face shield over the mask or over it. Why do they use gold? Because it protects them from radiation. And what do you notice about that gold plating on it? What does it look like? It's a mirror. It's a mirror. 
There's one other evidence to suggest, and I'm not saying that the, that the ark was designed to be a mirror. I think it's possible. I think it's possible. Maybe take a little more investigation into this. But there's one more piece of evidence. The Hebrew word for overlay, where it says to overlay it with gold, that Hebrew word is tzapha. That same word is used in other places, and it means something complete. What we think of is completely different. He ruleth by the might. Uh, he ruleth by his might forever. His eyes observe the nations. That word "observe" that's found quite a few times in the Torah is also the word "safa." So when it's actually saying to overlay it with pure gold, is it possibly saying that to make a mirror over the over the ark so that it can observe you, and that's why it is a testimony with us. Because we can see ourselves, or the Kohen Gadol, when he goes in, he can see himself in that. That, is, I believe, is why the, the, the Torah, the scroll of the Torah, was placed beside the ark, because now there's two of them. There's one in the mirror, and then there's the original. The lid. The lid. How do most translations, or not most, some of them, King James, how do they translate the lid of the Ark of the Covenant? The mercy seat. The Hebrew word is kaforet. Kaforet. It comes from the root kafar. Kafar means to, anybody know? Cover. Where do you think our word cover comes from? Kafar. There, there are many, many examples. This is a study of edenics. Rob Miller was talking about it a little bit the other day. This is a study of edenics. There, Isaac Moseson has documented 35,000 English words that are directly related to Hebrew. Oh, there's a lot of them. Okay, the Hebrew word kafar, the verb kafar means to cover over. A kafaret is a cover. It's just a lid. Okay, yet for some reason, the King James translators have to put in their mercy seat. Now, first of all, I have a problem with that because they're interpreting the text for it. That's just an interpretation. And they're giving you their interpretation. However, there's a reason for it. Most of us not, may not be aware of. Uh, but still, I would much prefer to see a translation of the cover of, this, of the ark or the lid of the ark with a footnote explaining what this means, which is what I'm going to go into now. Cherubim. In the King James, it says cherubims. Anybody recognize the problem with that? Yeah, the S. Okay, cherubim is the plural form, the Hebrew plural form of cherub or cheruv, cheruvim. Okay, cherubs is a plural plural. Anyway. Anybody know what a cherubim looks like? Or a cherub, a cheruv? A lot of eyes? Okay, let's talk about the cheruvim. All right, on top of that ark, on top of that picture, is the way most of the times we see depicted the cherubim uh, is two angels with their wings stretched out in front and touching at the tips. That's the way most of us picture it. Indiana Jones, that's, that's how it looks, right? So it must be right. Hollywood said so. What, where do we get most of our imagery of characters and events in the Bible? From artists, sculptors from the, from the Middle Ages, even modern times. This is a picture of the famous Last Supper. This is how many people view the Last Supper. Is there anything wrong with this picture? All right, let's see if we can find out what they are. What? It's Greek. How is it Greek? Just the way it's laid out. A table. There were no tables. How, were they sitting in chairs? They were reclining on pillows. What else? Should be dark outside. It noon there in that picture. What else? What? They're all well. I think that's that's a, maybe uh, artist license because you don't want to look at their backs. But you're right. They're all on one side of the table. Leaven bread, puffy bread. There ain't no matzo fish. <laughs> Anything else? No Jews. There is one Jew in that picture. Judas. He's always portrayed as Jewish. Hmm. Anything else? What? No lamb? What? Blonde hair. They look like Italians. Okay. I'll tell you what my biggest pet peeve with this picture is. No children. 
We never thought of that, did we? Nowhere in the text does it say only the 12 Talmudim were with him. with him. It never says that. When the rabbi did a Seder, when you watch documentaries on Jewish homes, when, maybe you've seen them on, on, even on some movies, when they do a Seder, who comes? The whole family. We have 12 Talmudim. How many? Some of them were married. We know that, right? How many children, grandchildren? I envision Yeshua's Passover Seder with uh, maybe 60, 70 people, children running around. I mean, can you imagine that? That's the, this is not a Passover Seder. Okay? I imagine the rabbi. There's another thing that's missing here. The Talits. Okay? Oh, oh they weren't Jewish, were they? <laughs> Anyway, my point to this is that a lot of our perceptions of biblical events and characters come from artists' renditions. So when we look at something like, uh, well, let's take a look at this verse first. And you shall make the two cherubim of gold of hammered work. Shall you make them on the two ends, two ends of the mercy seat, the lid, the lid of the box. Make one cherub on one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. For, notice that the two ends, the two far ends. Okay, keep that in mind. The cherubim or cherubim shall spread out their wings above overshadowing the mercy seat, the lid, with their wings. Their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Now, here is... Okay, here's the Hebrew word cherovim. He drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed the cherovim, cherovim, plural, plural, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of the life. Remember when I talked about earlier about the flaming pot and the, and the torch were one and the same thing because of the verb? Now, there's no verb here to indicate this, but I personally believe that these, are, these two things are one and the same thing, the cherovim and the flaming sword, because the flaming sword, or the, the sword in Hebrew is kerev. The cherovim is cherev. They're cognates, possibly very closely related. Okay? Now, we know that there's a cherovim at the Garden of Eden. And we have two, there were at least two of them in the Garden of Eden because it's a plural. And we have two of them on the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, there's a singular form, or excuse me, keruv for keruvim. This is the word cherev for sword. Very closely related. Also, this, remember I talked about the thorn bush of uh, Mount Sinai? Okay, it's actually, a, it's not just a, a flaming bush, it's a flaming thorn bush. But also sin. Mount Sinai, both the wilderness of sin, those words are also related to thorns. In Hebraic thought, thorns can be good and they can be bad. Okay? They can be a flesh or a thorn in your side, but they can also be a hedge of protection. Balance. In vain have I smitten your children. They took no correction. Your own sword devoured your prophets like a ravening lion. Here, a sword is being equated with a lion. In Genesis, we saw a sword being equated with the cherovim. Just keep those in mind. We're trying to put together a puzzle here. This is an Akkadian. Now, the Akkadians are related to the Hebrews. They're a Semitic people. They speak a language very similar to Hebrew. It's a Semitic language. This is a bas relief of a cheruv. And what is it? It is a lion with the head of an eagle with wings. Okay, that's a picture of a karuv in the Akkadian culture. The Hebrew word karuv, we talked about uh, the word cover, kafar. Kafar in, he in Hebrew, in English, it means cover, and our word cover comes from it. There's a lot of examples of this. Here's another example. K-R-U-V, karuv. If we do a little, what's called, there's a, a, a law called Grimm's Law. It's an etymological uh, etymological uh, method of trying to find words in one culture that come from another culture. And sometimes certain letters that sound alike get swapped. M's and N's. Okay? They get swapped from one culture to another. Like kafar, the P, the F, 
is similar to the v, so it changes to cover. Those, that's Grimm's law being applied there, taking similar sounding sounds and swapping them for another similar one. So let's see what happens when we take the K-R-U-V and we have gariv, G-R-Y-V. This is a cognate. It's very similar in sound. Change the V to a F, and we have griff. Add a suffix, the Greek suffix, and we have griffos. So a karuv, etymologically, can be a griffos, or what we call a griffin. Here's a griffos in the Greek culture again, a lion. A lion, in this case, it's got a lion head, but it has the wings. Here it is in English, British heraldry, common is the griffos, the griffin. Interestingly, in ancient cultures, the griffins were the ones who guarded the thrones. What do we have on top of the Ark of the Covenant? The cherubim. On, and is the Ark a throne? Imagine yourself, I don't have a picture of this, I wish I did. Imagine the Ark of the Covenant right here in front of me, a box. And what did I say? There was one cherub on one end and one on the other end. There, okay. Instead of looking at them facing this way or facing each other, think of them facing this way on each end, their heads turned facing each other, one wing of the cherub laying on its side, and on this side, this wing touching the wing of this one. What have I just created? A chair, a throne. And it is possible that that is the way that the Ark of the Covenant looked, which is why they translated it as mercy seat, because it was the throne of God, the seat, with the cherubim on both sides as the arm rests and the back of that chair. This, I don't think, is what the actual Ark looked like. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammer work, shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Let me jump into Moshe, the central figure of the Torah. Let's take a look at Moshe. How am I on time? Five minutes. Oh, my gosh. All right, we're going to fly through these. We're done. <laughs> this is, uh, we looked at an example, I, not this one, but another inscription. This is the Hebrew word El. We've got the Aleph and the Lamed. Okay? And that word means El, the strong one of authority. There's another interesting thing about this word is that the ox has two horns. The shepherd's staff, in ancient cultures, the horns represented the strength of the one in authority. The shepherd's staff was carried by the kings to show his, his authority. What did the ancient people's, ancient kings wear and carry? Horns, like the, kind of like the Vikings' horns, and they would carry a staff. Here it is in the modern culture, the crown and the scepter. Those things exist today in modern royalty. We have, uh, you know how some crowns have the points on them? By the way, crown, that comes from the Hebrew word karen. What does karen mean? Horns. The crown are the horns. And these are the horns. Some of them have just points coming up. The crown represents the horns. The scepter represents the staff. Now, Moshe was the leader, the, the strength and authority of Israel, correct? Did he have a scepter and horns? Did he have a scepter? Did he have a staff? Yes. Thank you. Okay, let's take a look at that one first. And the Lord said to Moshe, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh. That word is Elohim. I make you as Elohim to Pharaoh. Elohim, El, it has to have the horns and the scepter. And Yahweh said to Moshe, See, I gave you Elohim. That's what it literally says in the, in the Hebrew, from the Hebrew. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod, a mate. I think it's the word mate, a staff. So we know he had a staff. There's half of the equation. And there is Moshe. Looks like Monty. <laughs> and when Aharon and all the people of Israel saw Moshe, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. There it is. There's the other half. Do you see it? Do you see the horns? Oh, wait a minute, that's English, I'm sorry. If we translate this directly from the Hebrew literally, this is what it says. 
And Aharon and all the sons of Israel saw Moshe, and behold, the skin of his face had horns, and they were afraid to come near to him. What? Your translations translated as rays of light or shone. That is not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew literally says he had horns. Karan. Remember the Hebrew word Karan? The verb Karan is the word that's not the same word, by the way, as the Muslim Quran. But the, he had horns. That's what it literally says in the Hebrew. This is my pet peeve with translations. The translators, oh, they don't understand that. Oh, that don't make no sense. Let's fix the text for them. The translators are like uh, Caltrans in California or the Mississippi Dot. You know, uh, you got a road with potholes in it. What do they do? They fill them. They come in and they pave it over. Let's start with a dirt road. You drive down the road. Okay? Well, that, that's not pleasant. So they come in and they lay a layer of rock down. Now it's kind of like this. Okay? It's not too bad. But then they come along later on. They put the pavement. Now you can fly through it at 90 miles an hour. Have a nice, smooth ride. That's what the translators are doing for you. They don't want you to have to worry about the problems in the text. They, they are like Caltrans. What is it called in Oregon here? No, what is it? ODOT. ODOT. <laughs> ODOT comes along and they lay that pavement down. The translators lay down the pavement. They fix the text. They fill in all the potholes for you. So you can pick up that Bible and you can just read it to your heart's content and everything's okie dokie. The only problem is they're interpreting the text for you. They're erasing a lot of the Hebraisms and a lot of Hebraic understandings. And I have what, one minute left? <laughs> Okay, thank you very... <laughs> I don't think they're going to let me finish this one. <laughs> okay, the, uh, what's going on here? Liter here's, here's Michelangelo's picture, by the way, or sculpture of Moshe. Uh, what's that on top of his head? Let me make it a little clearer for you. There are horns there. There are horns. That's Michelangelo. He got something right for once. Might have messed up on the Last Supper, but he's got horns there. What's the problem we're all making right now? Horns? We're thinking image, picture, appearance. That's Greek. What is the function of the horns? Power, strength. God was making a point. This text is making a point. It's saying he has the power. He has the staff of God. Now he has the power of God. Now, was it literally horns coming off his face? I don't know. I don't care. The Hebrews didn't care. Well, they did because they were scared of it. Because whatever it was coming off his face, they were scared of it. But the point is, is trying to make a point that we have now the authority, the staff, we have the power, the horns. And the author did this on purpose so that you can see that, but the translators come along and they just completely erased it. That's what I've got a problem with the translation, which is why the mechanical translation shows you he had horns. Okay? It's up to you, the students, to go, wait a minute, I don't like that. Okay? then you need to dig deeper. Am I wrong? How do you know? Have you looked at it? You've got to go out there and search yourselves. You've got to start digging into the books. You've got to look up those Hebrew words as best as you can with what tools you have to see why the text says what it does. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.